welcome to Bible Meds Soul Medication. So today we have an interesting subject is the truth about angels. Mysteries of angels ranks in the sanctuary. Archangels, seraphs, cherubs, demons, UFOs, and the overmastering delusion. So we we all gonna present something in there. We're all gonna talk about it. It's a talk, and I think people learn better. So uh, before we start, we want to remind people any citation or article are not ours per se, but for evangelism purposes. We want to let you let you know to subscribe to our YouTube channel to know the latest uh, video that's coming out. And also we have our devotional on Instagram, Facebook. That's where you can find us. Or you can email us also. So the truth about angel, mysteries of angels ranks in the sanctuary, part one. So we'll have a part two after this. So before we start, let's have a word prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And as we are in your Sabbath, we want to know about the angels, Lord, and help us to understand their work in our lives, even though we know the Godhead is fully involved, but also the angels. Be with us, protect us, and keep us safe. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so why do we need to know about the angels? Well, first off, we have this wonderful quote found in the Upward Look, and it reads, we need to understand better than we do the work of these angel visitants. So we have to make it a purpose for us to study how they operate and how they minister unto us, and we'll see that throughout this study, and we hope that uh, you guys will be blessed. Um, and also, we, we'll, we've been seeing even this week, I don't know if you guys realize, but uh, since uh, last year or since 2020, there's been a rise of uh, UFOs being uh, noticed uh, in the sky throughout the world. And even, you know, government unclassifying information on these things. Um, so this week, there was also something happened in Derby, I believe it's in England, Mysterious lights from a number of unidentified flying objects were spotted in the night sky over Derby at the weekend. This is this is back. This is October 10th. So, yeah, I believe that was this week. Leaving a construction worker baffled. So mm. this, this this has been ongoing for the past few years or a couple of years, I should say. Um. And it's funny, I found two books that people wrote, and the one, The Spaceship of Ezekiel, the author is convinced that uh, in Ezekiel's vision, when he saw the throne of God, that he believes it was the, a spaceship. And that uh, it was people going back in time to reveal, to show, you know, share knowledge with the, with the people at that time. And so a lot of people actually believe in this, um, that there's something, a connection between Ezekiel's uh, vision and the UFOs that we're seeing today. And, um, you know, like we're showing here in this slide, Ezekiel chapter one, you know, as he said, this was during the time when captivity, he saw in a vision God coming and there was the description of the four angels and I think if you go further down in Ezekiel chapter 9, chapter 10, you know, where the glory of God starts leaving because of the apostasy that was going on in Jerusalem. Um, it's, it's interesting because a lot of abductions are happening right now by aliens, and we won't talk, touch this too much, but by so-called aliens, and they're, when people get abducted, what they say is knowledge is given to them um, to mm -hmm. help. And there's a warning also that is given because they're saying that something is coming, but they have the solution to a problem. 
And you can see why it's important to know about angels because there are different beings out there that claim to have truth, to have mm -hmm. uh, a way for us to avoid crisis that is upon this world. So we need to know which side to be on. I don't know if you guys wanted to add to that. And um, uh, yeah, no, um, <clears throat> I always uh, I heard from somebody that uh, the point of UFOs or aliens is to just get people scared of Jesus's second coming. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know what these people are going to do. You know, uh, if you've seen the movie Independence Day, you know, they're coming to destroy Earth and everything. And so mm -hmm. it's setting this mindset that you know these people who aren't from this world are coming here and they're coming to just kill us hmm. very, and very. so i thought that was interesting and i and i've heard of testimonies also where people say well if there are beings outside of earth and stuff then is there really a god <laughs> you know so people start questioning all these things um and they feel like their faith is shaken when they hear these type of uh, news that are happening in the world. Um, also, you, you can think of when the abduction happened, usually they'll see like a light and come to them and then they feel like they're, they're taken away, they're unconscious. And it kind of makes you think of, you know, Genesis chapter 28 also where the angel or Jacob with the ladder, you know, Verse 12, I'll just read the yellow part. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up, up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. This is to show that how there's communication between earth and heaven, you know, and, and the way that it happened is through angels. And, you know, hearing these stories, we're seeing that, well, these uh, outer space uh, beings are communicating with us through these spaceships. And a lot of times what people are seeing are a lot of light. And then next thing you know, they're conscious for a while and they come back. So mm -hmm. I just thought that was interesting, these parallels there. We see something is definitely trying to mimic what's going on in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And even in a body, you can see a brain is connected to the spine. And the spine is like a ladder giving mm -hmm. the information to your spine. So it's just like Jacob's ladder. So you see all these things, even in our body, God is trying to show something, but it's like Satan want to hijack these symbols for his demons. Amen. Amen. And we know that ladder in John chapter one is none other than the son of man, Jesus. He's the one that came to put that connection between us and heaven that was lost because of sin. So we have to make sure as these things are happening that we're focused on the Son of Man. Because Amen. he's the one that's trying, not not any you know unidentified objects out there that's gonna get us back to heaven. No. Jesus already built that bridge, you know? So we have to be pretty clear about that. And that's why studying your word is very important. But we're gonna dive in some more in this topic and I hope that uh, it will leave you to thirst for more and go back and have a good foundation on this. And so what are these, uh, these beings that are coming to people? Well, for start, we can go back to Revelation 16, you know, that we saw and uh, our presentation on Revelation 17. Um, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and the false prophet. What are they? For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. <clears throat> now, what's interesting with this is that even the government now is involved in these UFOs, you know, mm -hmm. saying that. Um, there's something there and, you know, sending people to study them. And uh, it's interesting that aliens all throughout always been depicted as reptiles, always in green. And here in the mm -hmm. Bible, in Revelation chapter 16, it's saying that these un unclean spirits are like frogs. So, you know, mm -hmm. the Bible knows something. <laughs> it's Amen. giving us a head start of what to expect in the future. 
the type of deceptions that are going to happen um, to these uh, beings, fallen angels, we could say, that are coming to deceive us. So, so yeah, and that's why we cannot uh, worship angels, but we know they're there to help us. So um, in Colossians 2.18, let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into these things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up by the fleshly mind. So, Yes, we need to understand about angel, but they 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 don't they don't need to be worshipped. So only Jesus is worshipped. Amen. And here we have a, a little structure of why we're studying angels, but also you see here how the Godhead there are three: Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You know these three. Or in one. So if you want to study about the Godhead, we have a presentation about that. But the second position is the angels. And after we have mankind, and after we have animals. So I, I've said that before when the angel, one third of the angel fell, um, they no longer have the Holy Spirit. So they're acting like animals. Like those reptiles, those they want to destroy and kill. They don't have the image of God anymore. And they made Adam and Eve eat from the tree of good and evil to give them animal passion. So pretty much Satan is the only, if you don't accept God, the only way it's going down until animal passion. So that's why he's a snake, is a dragon. And that's why Walt Disney is good in that, presenting animals talking all the time. He wants animal to educate us and not Jesus Christ and his word. So, so Nick, can you read? Yes. Uh, it says, the Godhead was stirred with pity for the race. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. <clears throat> Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give himself an offering for sin. And then at the bottom on Isaiah 48, 16, There am I, and now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. So we see here that the plan of redemption was part of the Godhead. All three were there, but only Christ was going to become the mediator, giving his blood. But also we're going to see that also Jesus was also the arch, archangel. So all this, we have to unpack this in the great controversy. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about that is, mm -hmm. um, is exactly how all three of them work together. You know, exactly. uh, the father, it, this was his will, was the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with creation. The father had the will to create earth, but Jesus is the one that carried forward the work. Mm -hmm. So likewise, he died for the salvation of man. Amen. But none of that was possible unless he had the Holy Spirit to give him the power to do so. Exactly. Because the Holy Spirit was with him. So it is, it's amazing how they work so well with each other. The perfect family. <laughs> yep. So, Carl, can you read this statement? Yep. In Desire of Ages, page 22, it's, it reads, From the beginning, God in Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of men to the deceptive power of the apostate. So it, it didn't take the Godhead by surprise what Lucifer was doing, and people were going to be saying, so why he created them? You know, free will, for knowledge, and God is love. So even though he know what you're going to do, he still have to give you a chance 
of love that he had in his heart to create you. So I know a lot of people would have not taken that chance, but that's, that's what's love. Free well, will. And yeah, I think that people have a lot of, um, uh, I think there's a similarity when we have children. Mm-hmm. I have no idea how my kids are going to turn out. But I can tell you I wanted children. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So we see also here um, the chain of command from Jesus Christ. So in Revelation 1, 1 to 4 and verse 20, we see the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servant things it must shortly come to pass. And he said, and signified by his angel and unto the servant John. So we see from the father to the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And after we see the angels and we see John. So now we say, where's the Holy Spirit? But it's in verse 20 that uh, the seven golden uh, candlestick, the seven stars, are also associated with the Holy Spirit. So I, I guess it's more likely verse 4, from the seven spirit which are before his throne. So the Holy Spirit is involved, and the angel take that Holy Spirit and giving us the messages. So you see the importance of angels in the chain of command. It's very, very important. Nick? In the Desire of Ages, it reads, All the intelligences of heaven are in this army, and more than angels are in the ranks. The Holy Spirit, the representative of the captain of the Lord's host, comes down to direct the battle. So a, a pretty clear statement if people don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person. He's, he's controlling the angels. After he receives, he hears what the Father and the Son says. He has the oil. He's the one giving it to the angels, and the angels come to battle, but he's in the rank. He's the chief commanding, representing Christ in this battle. So he's not speaking of himself, but of Christ. And that's why we said every party in the third, uh, in the Godhead, they speak of the other one. Jesus talked about his father, and the Holy Spirit talks about Jesus. So it's really a chain of command. And after the angels point to Jesus. So clear statement. Paul? A measure of the spirit is given to every man to profit, to profit with him. Through the ministry of the angels, the Holy Spirit is enabled to work upon the mind and heart of the human agent and draw him to Christ, who has paid the ransom money for his soul, that the sinner may be rescued from the slavery of sin and Satan. But the spirit of God does not interfere with the freedom of the human agent. The Holy Spirit is given to be a helper so that the human agent may cooperate with the divine intelligences. And it is its province to draw the soul, but never to force obedience. Amen. So more close to see the work of the angel with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. working together upon the mind and upon us humans. So it's it's pretty clear. So this is a quote about the ascension of Christ after he died on the cross and resurrected. And he was welcomed because he was triumphant from the graves. And we could see here uh, the throne room. And maybe I can ask uh, Nick to read. Oh, uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> it, it says, there is the throne, and around it the rainbow of promise. There are cherubim and seraphim, the commanders of the angel hosts, the sons of God, 
the representatives of the unfallen worlds are assembled. The heavenly council before which Lucifer had accused God and his son, the representatives of those sinless realms over which Satan had thought to establish his dominion, all are there to welcome the Redeemer. They are eager to celebrate his triumph and glorify their king. And the verse that this is derived from is Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. So, so what we see here is as an ascension, when Revelation 4 and 5, we have cherub, we have seraphim, we have the commander of the angel of hosts, we have the sons of God, and we have the representative of the unfallen world. So there's other worlds out there, and the Bible text, there's, there's two or three. We're just going to give you one. It's Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice ye heaven, him that dwell uh, in them. So on earth, we, be, because we disobey uh, the command of Jesus, we ate from the tree of good and evil, Satan has access to our world. And that's why he has a great wrath upon our world. So people have to understand that Satan has no longer access to the other world. So the, the, the program, the TV show right now, it's on us. And we have to get out of this by choosing Jesus. So angels are real being in the heavenly council. And another aspect, um, Carl? Yep. Um, you can each listen as Bezalel well, fashion the Candelabrum, the clang of his hammer cried out again and again as he beat the formless gold into shape. Each blow of the beating resounded with Calvary's agony. By bitter stripes, Christ's luminous life was fashioned, and the gold of his love made perfect through suffering as he learned obedience and developed faith as our example. And um, in Exodus 25, 18, it showed the two cherubims well, on the top of the ark were made out of gold, of beaten work. So it's funny that the candlestick and the angels are beaten work. So they go to the suffering of Christ. The Holy Spirit, all of them, they suffer, especially everybody as a guardian angel. We'll see that in the presentation. But they get beaten. They have to give messages. And sometimes, how many times we didn't listen? when God is sending a message to us. But these angels, sometimes they have to come two, three times and carry the Holy Spirit. All of this to say they get beat and they also got beaten when they saw Christ crucified. It hurts them to see their general on the cross. And also uh, we have a citation in the Bible where, where Paul is making a connection in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, on the word beaten, I therefore so run, not as an uncertainly so fight, I, not as one beating the air. Who's beating the air is angel, but he's not beating the air with nonsense. He's really beating the air with the word of God. He's touching lives. So angel also, when they beat the air, they, beat the air, they bring the truth to us. So it's really important to understand uh, that aspect also. There was um there was something else that I wanted to mention. Mm -hmm. Um, what's interesting is why did the angels need to be beaten? You know, this is a mm -hmm. question that's going through my head. Is like, you know, why why did they need a savior? Why why mm -hmm. was Jesus dying on the cross so important to them? And um, one of the questions that Satan had brought up is how can you be just and merciful at the same time? And yet whenever Jesus died on the cross, they, the angels finally saw his mercy mingled with justice. Amen. Amen. But, Amen. but, you know, what, what's the next big, big thing, next big deception that Satan had in store for um, the worlds, you will. 
you know, why didn't it just end at Calvary? Well, Satan, you know, being the wily foe he is, he put another deception out there in which it was, uh, you know what, we're all about mercy. You don't need to keep all the commandments of God anymore. Mm -hmm. He died for you. You're good. You don't have to keep the commandments. And that's the next deception. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important that, you know, there's a group of individuals living perfectly at the end. And so it's amazing uh, through that imagery of the beating of the angel, because I never noticed that until I saw this presentation. I didn't uh, think in my head, you know, they're a beaten work just like the lampstand. Mm -hmm. So they're going through uh, the experience, not firsthand, but in a, you know, they're ministering spirits. Amen. Oh, and that is Amen. also why they can sing the song uh, in, uh, what is it, Revelation 5, with us. Amen. Amen. So, so they, they're, going, they're going through the pain. And that's why in yeah. Hebrews 1, 7, and 14, and the angel, he said, who make his angel spirit and his ministers a flame of fire. So they also fire. And are they not all ministering spirits sent? For, to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Amen. Pretty clear. So, uh, Carl? All right, we're going <clears> to <throat> talk about Lucifer a little bit. bit. Sorry. <clears throat> and Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Lucifer was the most exalted angel in the universe, the most influential, and the most beautiful. His name is from the Latin Luke's light and Pharaoh, I bear, and means bearer of light. So thank you. So Lucifer was a bearer of light, and we have a little animal uh, insect here, a firefly. He's bearing the light. So pretty much as an example, Lucifer was carrying the light of God through his stones, and that's why he was made with that. And the tablet and the pipes, this is for part two. We will not dive in the jewelry and everything right now, but part two will go deep in. So um, now what's a, what's a cherub? He was a covering cherub. So Nick, can you read uh, the text? Of course. Uh, Hebrew, the Hebrew letter of cherub, K, means like, and that its second syllable, the RB, uh, signifies one great in power and wisdom and glory, or whatever can be termed perfection. It is the root of rabbi and may be applied to God. The term cherub therefore describes one who is like the divine majesty and focuses on his character. So we see here they're ministers. So now through the word cherub, we see they're like rabbi. So they're getting the messages from, from the Godhead, from the Holy Spirit, and they bring it to us. They're like divine majesty. So it's really, their work is really important. And that's why uh, we're studying this and even Lucifer's role when he was in heaven. It, it, uh-huh. it's yeah. if, if I may comment, uh, yeah, I, I think of uh, whenever the Pharisees trying to mock Jesus and they're calling him rabbi or great teacher and stuff like that, and it just makes mm-hmm. me think of you know, uh, Jesus learned from uh, I think the angels too, you know, Gabriel was his angel, so I'm sure that they had exactly. conversations, and so uh, uh, that's really interesting to me. I didn't know that. Yeah, because because Jesus had to learn from scratch. He emptied himself. So yeah, we have a presentation on the incarnation. If you 
watch it, you will understand better what Jesus did by being come as the son of God on this earth. So, so Carl? He who was once the covering cherub, whose work it was to hide from the heavenly intelligences the glory of God, perverted his intellect and divorced himself from God. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 19, it reads, And they said unto Moses, Exodus, sorry, 20, verse 19, And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So, <clears throat> You're seeing here, it's, there's a parallel, just like Moses was kind of interceding, was in the middle, just because of God's glory being too much for the people. We're seeing um, Lucifer also, he's in the middle, he's in between God and the angels. He's the one that's taken all the glory and then given it in measure to the people, to the angels at the time. And it, it says the same thing for or ministers in these last days, when you, people are coming in the church, you cannot give them too much. You have to give mm -hmm. them by measure. You have to cover. You cannot tell them everything. But as they mature, you give them little by little, and they understand Christ better, and they see the glory of Christ and the love of Jesus, and so they can fall in love. Amen. So we see here, thou shalt make two cherubs of gold, <clears throat> of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. <clears throat> so we see that in the most holy place, the two cherubs covering the law of God, and this is the representation. So now we're going to go a bit deeper um, on this, on how... A cherub it dis is described. So, uh, Nick, can you read both texts? Yes, in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And in Ezekiel 10, verses 10 through 14, and as for their appearances, they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked, they followed it. They turned not as they went, and their whole body, and their backs, and their hands, and their wings, and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel, and every one had four faces. The, four, the first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third, the face of a lion, and the fourth, the face of an eagle. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nick, for the reading. So we see here, they have the likeness of a man. So they can appear also as men when they communicate with us. So that's why the fallen angel can do the same in this world right now. But what's interesting, the perfect coordination. They don't say, I want to go here, I want to go there, even though they have four faces. So the work of God is synchronized. They move the throne and everything, but they have hands, they have wings, and they are full of eyes. So also we see the aspect of the Holy Spirit in them. Hands was a symbol of Jesus healing with his hand through the Holy Spirit. So you can see that in uh, Luke 11 and Matthew 12, but also they're full of eyes. So they're receiving the light from the Holy Spirit, the messages, so they know exactly what to tell you. So your next chapter you're reading in the Bible, where are you at? and how they're going to help you because they receive that light from Jesus going uh, to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit give it to the angels to minister unto us. So all that and four faces, we will uh, study that uh, deeper too on the next presentation. 
but you see the face of a cherub. I guess it's the oxen, the face of a man, the face of the lion, and the face of an eagle. So we have a presentation on the four temperaments on this channel. You can take a look at that. So um, also, there's something that they have is their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf foot and they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. Who does have burnished brass at his feet? Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus. So what's brass signify? Uh, him, him burning at the burning, altar. and also sacrifice. brass is, yep, the sacrifice, and brass is also impenetrable by sin. So those angels mm. they deal with sin, but sin is not entering them. On uh, only those who rejected um, Christ, but they, sin is not entering them. So when they minister to us, even our guardian angel are not tainted by sin if they remain with Jesus. So they, 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 they're doing this work also. So, uh, Carl? Ezekiel one twenty six and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Amen. So above uh, the sapphire stone is the Father, Jesus, they're on the throne. So you see the throne here. And what's funny with, um, with the throne, it's really also the mercy seat. You know, we have to open the ark, the platform over it. So it's the mercy seat moving. And that's why we have in weddings, you have somebody on the throne and you have four men holding that person or a procession of kings and queens uh, back in the time. And when you look at the throne, it looked like a car. That's the first car that you have. You, you, have, angel, you have angels in four corner and wheel, wheels within the wheel. So even when we get a car, we have to copy Christ model and you have somebody sitting on top or just like a ship, like a boat. All these symbols are here. And that's why today we have the symbol of UFOs, deceiving angels trying to copy God's model. They were in heaven. So here we also have uh, in Solomon's temple, we have four angels. So now you're going to say, we saw two angels on the mercy seat. How come now it's four? So, um, Nick, can you read uh, the first two texts? Yes. Uh, four heavenly angels always accompanied the ark and all its journeyings. Uh, Jesus, the Son of God, followed by heavenly angels, went before the ark as it came to the uh, Jordan, and the waters were cut off before his presence. Christ and the uh, and angels stood by the ark and the priests in the bed of the river until all Israel had passed over the Jordan. Wow. Um, and then in 1 Kings 8, verse 6 through 7, and the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staffs thereof, the, above. So, so we see here, there's all, always four angels always with the ark, and Jesus, the Son of God, followed by the heavenly angels, went before the ark. So we just saw the, the throne, there's four angels underneath, so sometimes it can you can see two to just represent, you know, the covering cherubs, but they, they're usually four. And we, we can say already 
back back then or before from eternity uh, before that Lucifer was on it in Gabriel because we know Gabriel is going to take the spot of Lucifer that became Satan. So four angels, four cherubs always in the ark. So another description that's very interesting that a minister, when people, a lot of people don't really fully understand what's anointing. So Lucifer is the first described as the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28, 14. The word which inspire use is Marshak, the root from which Messiah is, the, is derived. I, ironic, it all now seems, he whom God appointed as a messianic harbinger of light was so puffed up with himself that he developed into the, the devil, the prince of darkness. So what's a harbinger? A person or thing that announces or signals the approach of another. So even though he's anointed as like a messiah, he's not going to be the one dying or anything, but he's, he's supposed to point to Christ. It's almost like Lucifer was a vice president pointing to the president, but he wanted that glory for himself because of his stones. Like you can see, he has nine stone here, but the real high priests have 12 stones. So here we see he was supposed, su supposed to point to Christ. So very important. So is he, was he only a cherub? Or he was also a seraph. So, uh, Paul, can you read? Yep, man, great controversy. Satan seems paralyzed as he beholds the glory and majesty of Christ. He who was once a covering cherub remembers whence he has fallen. A shining seraph, son of the morning, how changed, how degraded. From the council where once he was honored, he is forever excluded. And the Hebrew verb seraph, meaning burning, its derivative seraph describes the gleaming one. Isaiah 6 2, or shining seraph. So, thank you. So, we see here that he was the son of the morning, a shining seraph. So, also, he could bear that light. So, we saw the cherub mean minister you know, majestic ministers, but when they give them part of the light, they become seraph. So they get the, the message from Jesus through the Holy Spirit, but when they give it to it, they shine. And we're going to see different aspects of seraph through this presentation. So this is how he's burning. So it's very important to understand these uh, aspects. So another aspect of seraph is when they're in the presence of Jesus, giving him glory in the Father, they veil them their face. And that's why they have the two extra wings when they're giving worship. So um, Paul, can you read? Yep, Isaiah 6. Starting from verse 2, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The seraphim around the throne are so filled with reverential awe as they behold the glory of God that they do not for an instant look upon themselves with admiration. Around the throne were seraphim as guards about the great king, and they reflected the glory that surrounded them. As their songs of praise resounded in deep notes of adoration, the pillars of the gate trembled as if shaken by an earthquake, with lips unpolluted by sin, 
These angels poured forth the praises of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Is the Lord of hosts, sorry. They cried, the whole earth is full of his glory. So we see here when they cry, holy, holy. So they have a reverential awe when they see the glory of God. And they're not tainted by sin. So now you're going to say, so is cherub a seraph? They're pretty much interchangeable because we see here now when they're in the presence of glory, it's like they have that extra wing to cover their face. But when they minister unto us, they come as cherubs. But when they're imparting the light, they turn into seraph also. So to, to further this point, we'll see um, another quote. So we see here another symbol uh, of that. So Nick, can you read? Yes, and it says, There are the columns of angels on either side, and the ransomed of God walk in through the cherubims and seraphims. Christ bids them welcome and puts upon them his benediction. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. What is that joy? He sees the travail of his soul and is satisfied. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So we see here also that, okay, you see cherub and you see seraphim. The seraphim that's always in the presence of God because they give him glory, they kind of stay in a state of seraph because they're always giving glory to the father and the son. So now they stay more seraph. But cherubs that moving the throne, they they might say uh, they might stay cherub for for a while but when they give the praise they might turn into a seraph I, I hope people see the distinction of those ministers light bearers and understand that also lucifer was also a seraph so i think it's it's getting clear but you're going to see other passages to understand that clearly if so, i if i may say something also um, yep. I feel like it's like uh, it's it's like names in the Bible, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, Jacob, but then you also have uh, you know Israel. Both are talking yep. about the same person, but it, it it's what best describes them in the moment mm -hmm. of their life. And so I feel I feel like maybe that's exactly the same way as cherubim and seraphim. It's whatever function they are performing, yes, say, exactly. at, at that moment. Not that they're different. It's just a different name to describe the action that they're doing. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So um, another thing that settled, settled that understanding for us was Revelation 4, 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. So now we see those four beasts have six wings, but before you might say, uh, they have four wings, but we, we're going to say, see, and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying, holy, holy, holy Lord God almighty, which was and is and is to come. So now if you compare Ezekiel one eleven. Thus were face and the wings were stretched upward and two wings of everyone were joined one to another to cover their body. So you might feel like, oh, here it is, it's four. Two cover their body and two to fly. But when they're praising, you see the six. Do you see the difference when they are ministering towards Jesus in the most holy place, and the Father, the, the six wing, you see the six wing, and you see the six wing here in Revelation 4 8. So, uh, Carl, the bull parts. Yeah. Vision of glory leads, leads to genuine conviction of unworthiness. 
And the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah was permitted in vision to look into the holy place and into the holy of holies in the heavenly sanctuary. Cherubim were on either side of the mercy seat as guards round the great king, and they glowed with the glory that enshrouded them from the presence of God. These holy beings sung forth the praise and glory of God with lips un unpolluted with sin. The contrast between the feeble praise which he had been accustomed to bestow upon the Creator and the fervid praises of the seraphim astonished and humiliated the prophet. He had for the time being the sublime privilege of appreciating the spotless purity of Jehovah's exalted character. So, so thank you. So we see why Isaiah, when he saw the glory in the most holy place, and I'm sure um, it's tied with the Day of Atonement also, those seraph clean our lips so we can minister. Because in that same Isaiah 6, God is sending us. Who shall I send? So we have to be, see the glory of God, see our condition of impurity, so we can be purified and receive the garment and do the work that God is asking the church to do. But we have, we have to see our condition first because these angels, those seraphs, they see the holiness of God. They're unpolluted by sin. So that's why they use these coals on our lips. So um, another quote here, should the angel Gabriel or one of the seraphims to be sent to the world to take human nature and to teach men the mystery of science and the knowledge of God. So we see here, Gabriel is the, the angel that's in the presence of God, but also seraph is like big, God is, uh, the spirit of prophecy is trying to say, this is how they impart knowledge and science. So because Gabriel is anointed and those seraph, when they have that light, they come to us. When we read the scriptures, they enlighten us science and knowledge, the knowledge of God. So it's very important. I hope you start to see um, the parameters to understand the cherub and the seraphim as how they work. So, um, um, Carl? Let Ken Vincent read the sixth chapter of Isaiah and take its lesson home to their hearts. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this have touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. So people that's ministering, <clears throat> we have seraphim with us because you're teaching the word. As we're teaching right now, there must be angels all around us and we don't even see them. And they give us ideas from Jesus to say what to say. And as we explaining this subject, this is how the confidence we should have to minister to the soul as canvasser or Bible worker what, whatever you're doing, you have the angels with you, just like Isaiah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing how, uh, you know, they took the live coal off the altar, signifying uh, Jesus' crucifixion. But then um, in your previous slide, it was saying, you know, uh, what if the seraphim was sent to uh, tell of the science Mm -hmm. And I remember um, the quote you shared in past presentations that the gospel is often related to science. The science of the gospel is to be studied 
throughout all eternity. Amen. So isn't that just wonderful how it's the angels is going to uh, continue to teach us? Amen. Amen. Because they were teaching us in the garden um, also. So we have another um, teacher that understood his role was John the Baptist, the Messianic Harbinger. So <clears throat> John the Baptist illustrate this dual concept by being both burning and a shining light, warming the heart of his hearers with the wonders of the gospel hope while illuminating the, their minds with the glorious truth. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from men, but these things I say, that he might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and he were willing for a season to rejoice in the light. So you do you see the role of John the Baptist, even though we are human, we are not exactly cherub or seraphim, but our role is already working here. We will replace one third of the angel. So we already need to start burning and shining for Jesus right now. So that's pretty exciting. If John was able to do that and we take hold of the gospel, we can do the same burning and shining for Jesus. So he understood the, his role by taking the truth, presenting it to the people by teaching them about Jesus, but also repentance, you know, showing them their condition so they can come to Christ and prepare. So I don't know if anyone wants to say something. No, this is good. We're good. So, Jesus was also a seraph, even though he was fully man, he was fully God. At the transfiguration, he was transfigured before them, and his face, his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. So we have an example how Jesus was ministering, but at this time he decided to fully glow. And the transfiguration happened, and he, the people, uh, the disciple could see Elijah and Moses that were already in heaven translated. So you see the aspect of Jesus also as a seraph. And another time, we saw that with John, he was a shining and burning. Remember after his resurrection, those two men in the road of Emmaus, it says in Luke 24, 32, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talks with us? By the way, and while he opened us the scriptures. So as you open in the scriptures and you're excited when you see a passage and you're connecting with the other one, you're burning. That's mean the Holy Spirit is in your heart, but also receiving it from a seraph that, in, that is the enlightening your mind at that moment. So it's really important to go back to the word and do line upon line, precept upon precept, if you want to be enlightened. And it also makes you think of the burning bush talking to Moses. Exactly. Sending him out to, to give a message to deliver his people. So, yep, and, Jesus was a seraph <clears throat> at that time, the burning bush. It was burning. And, and isn't it funny how um, in the story of Exodus, you have the, uh, the angel of the Lord, and who is that? Uh, that that's Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> that's Jesus. Amen. Amen. Always burning and shining. So, all these aspects. So, um, 
we have I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. Uh, maybe, Carl, can you read this one? The words of the angel, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, show that he holds a position of high honor in the heavenly courts. When he came with a message to Daniel, he said, there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, Christ, your prince, Daniel 10, 21. Of Gabriel, the Savior speaks in the Revelation, saying that he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, Revelation 1, verse 1. And to John the angel declared, I am a fellow servant with thee and with thy brethren, the prophets, Revelation 22, verse 9. That the angel who stands next in honor for the son to the Son of God is the one chosen to open the purposes of God to sinful men. So Gabriel is sent, and that's why you see Gabriel in both prophecy books, Daniel and Revelation. He's the one who's opening the plan of salvation and throughout prophecy, history receiving the Holy Spirit also, but he's the one next in the, in the presence of God. So it's important when you might be understanding uh, more and more about Daniel and Revelation, you have an angel, but also Gabriel works with other angels. Don't forget, he's, he's, he's a commander. So a commander has other angels underneath that he can send a seraph for you understanding maybe Daniel 3 or Daniel 1. I don't know which chapter you're you are on or you never start. If you pray and you ask Jesus, he will send his ministers to you so you can understand line upon line, precept upon precept. It's, uh, I noticed something is just a small thing, which is uh, Gabriel is still Jesus's angel. Even when he's in heaven, yep. You know he doesn't. He, you know he doesn't need a guardian angel, but here he is still his angel, and so it just makes me think of you know each one of us has an angel, and whenever we get to meet him, we get to you know have have those conversations with him about hey, what about this point in our in my <laughs> life? You know. What was going what on there? at this? What was what was going on at this point? I obviously <laughs> couldn't see you, but what was what was happening? Or, or probably them asking us, "What were you thinking at that point?" <laughs> 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 Nothing good. <laughs> so um, now we're going to get into the great controversy. A lot of people don't fully understand why Lucifer sinned and how it happened. So here uh, we see. He, Lucifer, had a knowledge of the inestimable value of the eternal riches that men did not possess. He had the experience, the pure contentment, the peace, the exalted happiness and alloyed joy of the heavenly abode. He had realized before his rebellion the satisfaction of the full approval of God. He had a full appreciation of the glory of that enshrouded the Father and knew that there was no limit to his power. So we see here Lucifer looking at the Father, and he knows the Father has no limit in his power. So a lot of people nowadays have problem with the second person of the Godhead. Is he created? Is it lower? All these things is because just like Lucifer, people see the father first. They, oh, wow, the father, the father. But Jesus is also called the everlasting father. But in this story right now, we don't know that yet because he's looking deeply into the father and he realized the father has no limit to his power. Follow the story. So here, um, Nick, can you read? Yes. <clears throat> In the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, it says, He might, that being Satan, have remained in favor with God, beloved and honored by all the angelic throng, presiding in his exalted position with generous, unselfish care, 
exercising his noble powers to bless others and to glorify his maker. But little by little, he began to seek his own honor and to employ his powers to attract attention and win praise to himself. He also gradually led the angels over whom he ruled to do him service instead of devoting all their powers to the service of their creator. Little by little, this found patriarchs and prophets, Lucifer came to indulge the desire for self-exaltation. Though all his glory was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. Hmm. So thank you. So hmm. here, he doesn't even have a problem with Jesus at this point. Meaning maybe he's the son of God, Michael, you know. But because he's receiving most of the orders at this point, and put in your mind the chapter of Isaiah 53. Jesus is, has nothing to please. He's humble. But remember, Lucifer has, he's next to Jesus. He's working with him. But him, he has the stone and he's more bright. And look at what happened. Little by little, he's be, he started to seek his own honor. And what got me the most, he, he also gradually led the angel over whom he ruled to do him service. So he said, go do this for me. He started, the, the power started to get to his head. He was supposed to be a messianic harbinger, taking from Jesus and give it to the angel. Already we see the deeds starting to happen by do this for me, do that for me, do this for me. So the angels in lower rank think it's from Jesus, these services. So how many ministers sometimes, when they get in power, they start doing, they love the position and start doing different stuff. And it leads them to scandals at some point because the power they're loving the power. They're loving the control of what they're having. So not even Jesus yet is in the picture. He's already starting to get the power for himself. So, Carl? The angels in less exalted position suppose that Lucifer was the ruler of heaven. His work of deception was done in so great secrecy that the angels in less exalted positions supposed that he was the ruler of heaven. He artfully presented these things to God. Uh, hold on. Satan made the representation that all wrong insinuations existing in heaven originated among the angels, while he himself had made suggestions which would never have been entertained by the angels had he not created them. He artfully presented these things to God as having come from the angels, while they all originated with the evil Satan himself. That is true deception. <laughs> so, so we see here, they don't even know about Jesus because Jesus is step to us. Uh, uh, he's ruling, but he's not making demands yet. He's letting Lucifer roll, uh, do the show. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And what's happening they thought Lucifer was the ruler of heaven. That's how much power the father and the son gave him. And now he started to do this stuff for himself. And they don't, they start looking only uh, at this point to Lucifer because, okay, we know he's getting stuff from the father, just like Moses was getting the law and the ordinances from the father and the son and receiving it from the Holy Spirit. And he's giving it to the people. But what the people saw, they saw Moses. So this is what's happening right now with Lucifer. They only see Lucifer, but they know he goes to the throne room to get this information. And, and, and this also shows you how scary it is to behold God's glory. Because mm -hmm. you can fall. Yep. I mean, it's, it's just so much that you start thinking it's coming from you now, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And exactly. We, we, as we see God, you had to keep looking on to Jesus, Jesus. to humble yourself, because that's the danger for anyone that's looking to, you know, know God more. 
he's going to reveal himself to you. But at the same time, you have to be careful that you don't start now exalting yourself and all these people that you're serving, making them serve you now. Exactly. It, uh, it, it, it makes you question what exactly is perfection. You know, you know, uh, Adam and Eve were created perfectly. The angels were created perfectly. Satan was created perfectly. But yet they fell. Hmm. And so it makes you think, well, then what is perfect? And you got to look at, uh, this is why it's so important to study the angels and, you know, Jesus. It's all selfless. Everything that they're doing is selfless. Selfless. It is for somebody else. And so that is perfect. It is looking, first off, it's looking to Jesus your eyes are always focused on Jesus. And so that, that's really what has uh, stuck out to me, at least. A- amen. Amen. So here we're going to get into the true position of his son. So there's a chapter, if you want to read the truth about angels, I'm putting it out there, page 32. This is what you need to understand in this passage. So I'm going to let Nick read all of it because it's so important. All right. Uh, Okay. On page 32, it says, Before the great contest should open, all were to have a clear presentation of his, God's will, whose wisdom and goodness were the spring of all their joy. The, uh, and this is Patriarchs and Prophets, Page 36. Also, so the, uh, the, the, the king. Yep. Yep. I was going to read that. The king of the universe summoned the heavenly host before him, that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his son and show the relation he sustained to all created beings. Before the assembled inhabitants of heaven, the king declared that none but Christ, the only begotten of God, could fully enter into his purposes, and to him it was committed to execute the mighty counsels of his will. So, so, so thank you. So here, even though they know Jesus was the son, they not understand that is the son of God sitting. He was on the throne before they were created. Hmm. So what the father did, he's passing the test with his son, the second person of the Godhead, make him working with the angels as a normal angel. And Lucifer is ruling more. And at some point, he's going to set the true position of his son. And he's going to have a meeting to say, hey, by the way, my son was always with me. And now if you have pride, it's going to be manifested. And this is how God tested the Pharisees. He was the son of Joseph and Mary. He grew and now started to teach and people started to go to Jesus. Where this guy came from? He's stealing our people. But who were there before? The Pharisees. But Jesus was there for all eternity. He's God. So he's just being manifested. And he's, the test is always the second person of the Godhead. This is the test. And this is where Lucifer fell. And this is a, a deeper uh, presentation. So Carl, can you read the statement? The great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son. The son was seated on the throne with the father, and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around him. The father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ his son should be equal with himself, so that wherever was the presence of his son, it was his own presence. The word of the son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the father. His son, he had invested with authority to command the heavenly host, especially was his son to work in union with himself 
and the anticipated creation of the earth and every living thing that should exist, exist upon the earth. His son would carry out his will and his purposes, but would do nothing of himself alone. The father's will would be fulfilled in him. The story of redemption. So can you read the Hebrew 6, 6 to 9? Because this is the presentation of what's happening in this chapter of the anointing of Jesus. Yep. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. Amen. So what do we see here? In heaven, that was the same test we got on earth. In all the angels needed to worship him. Let all the angels of God worship him. So that was the inauguration of Jesus being the son of God in front of all of them. So now, what did he do? He said, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever accepted right. So he's saying to Jesus, he's God. He's sitting on the throne with me. So from now on, Whatever my son says, you do it. Yeah. And why is that? We saw Lucifer step by step was having iniquity in his heart. And what do we see about Jesus that has loved righteousness and had hated iniquity? So Jesus, when he was up there, he was playing like a normal angel. He had no iniquity. He stepped back. Lucifer was ruling more. But when he stepped in, to sit up on the throne with his father because Lucifer already had deeds of iniquity, the rage now is starting in his heart. And he's going to attack the Ten Commandments also. So God anointed with oil of gladness above thy fellow. So I hope you started to see the great controversy, how it's happening. And people need to understand that you know, Jesus, like you said, Jesus was always there and that he was always equal with God. It's not like at this moment, somehow, yes. you know, it's just officially because there was a test. People didn't fully understand exactly. Jesus' position. And that's what we're seeing today. A lot of people are questioning who Jesus is. It was mm -hmm. he created. They're having all these issues. But we see this has this is a problem that goes way back. <laughs> you know, it's because he's always been the test. But we have to understand so, that he's equal with God, the Father. Amen, amen. And this is why we have uh, the group like Anti-Trinitarian. They want to make the Father the only. And after uh, the, Jesus came out of his ribs, all this, they have the same pro problem as Lucifer. Yeah. Not because they, don't, uh, they, because they don't dive in with humility in the scriptures to see that he was always... If you read Philippians 2, he was equal with God. So there was never a time that he was not, if not, he's not God. He's created and Lucifer is trying to portray Jesus this way to say he was created. So why I'm not the first one? He's just created just like me, even though it's for eternity's past. So if you make Jesus created, he's not God. He was always with God. That's why Jesus is uh, God says, Thy throne, O God, to Jesus. Amen. It, uh, <clears throat> it makes me think of, uh, you know, just speaking from a human standpoint, if I was to be demoted, mm -hmm. I would feel exactly what Satan feels like, even though, you know, Christ held that position the entire time. Mm-hmm only for you to just assume that he was much lower than you <laughs> and oh the the feelings but it goes to show you um it gave what it did do is it gave the opportunity for satan to step down 
Mm-hmm. He, it, yeah. it's, the, it's the John the Baptist experience, which is exactly, and we're going to get into while that. I must <laughs> decrease. Amen, amen. Because it just showed that you're not demoted. It's just you have to acknowledge now that Jesus is first in your life. Mm-hmm. But now yeah. because you, you hold as a minister or you're a CEO, but everything you have come from me, the breath, the, the mm-hmm. water, all this was like, okay. So just like tithing, 10%, you give it back to your creator. You acknowledge everything comes from him. And that's why people need um, to understand. And we see it here. He had the problem. Satan thought he was himself a favorite in heaven among the angels. Why? Were not his garment light and beautiful? Why should Christ thus be honored before himself? So because of his nine stones, you see the anger. But it's Jesus and the Father that created you like that to shine. So you just... You should gi- give the shout out to Jesus <laughs> that he created you like that. Nope. I'm going to take it like I, I created myself. That's why sin is a mystery. It, but it starts with elevating yourself above Jesus. That, that's pretty much how we can explain it. And on top of that, in the council, God was planning to create this earth. The creation of our world was brought into the council of heaven and the covering cherub prepared his request that he should be made prince to govern the world then in prospect. So now he has other issues. It's growing. Oh, now you, you got promoted and now you're going to create the planet Earth with this human. I want to be the one governing that too. No. When I create someone, I have to be the one because if sin happened, I have to be in charge. You cannot go to the cross. Even the angel wanted to go to the cross and Jesus said, no, you can't. The law equaled Jesus. And this is why it was not given to Lucifer to create this world. Even though God could have given him the power to do it, I don't know how, but Jesus remained creator with his father and with the Holy Spirit working all three together. So what did Jesus do in heaven? This is a perfect example in Luke 14, 8 to 11. So call. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee, and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may see, say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Amen. So the test, thank you, Carl. So the test in heaven, Jesus went to the lower ranks at sitting like, okay, letting Lucifer rule. And when the father called him to set the true position, he went higher. And just like friend go higher, then shall thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meet with thee. So now the father declared that my son needs the worship from this point on, worship him. But what did Lucifer did? Verse 11, for whosoever exalted himself shall be abased. He started to be abased because now he, he wanted that position. I'm the one. No one is coming higher than me. And he, had the, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Jesus humbled himself, just like Isaiah 53, a tender plant. That's why he's exalted above all names. So you see the Bible text, all these texts, how the great controversy explain 
what happened between Christ and Satan. So another problem was Lucifer was also called the son of the morning. So for him, it's like, I'm a son too. But Jesus is also the son of God. Also, when he got incarnated, he became another time the son of God because he emptied himself and the father prepared a body for him. But also his name in heaven was the bright and morning star. So all that to show that Jesus was also a son. Lucifer was also a son. And even the angels, he can call them son of God. So Nick, can you read um, these two verses? Yes, uh, in verse 4, <clears throat> it says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of, foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. So, so, so thank you. So we see here that the morning stars are angels, but also they are also sons of God. So you see the problem with the word son? They're all there, even when the test on Job came. Those sons of God came, present themselves, and see how faithful is Job. So now you have son of the morning, son of God, sons of God. So for him in his mind, he lowered the standard of Jesus when the father said, he was with me, he created everything with me. So now you might say, sons of God, do uh, you think they, they're like humans or they, uh, or they can marry or they can have children? Because you might hear the, the story of Nephilims, uh, the sons of God and the sons of men. And Nick, can you explain the difference with yes. Matthew 22 and 30, verse 30? Yes. So um, the, the phrase sons of God is used uh, many times in the Bible. Um, in one of the other times when talking about Adam, it is said that Adam was the son of God. But what's interesting is that once Adam fell, and you're talking about his descendants, they're now all of a sudden called the sons of Adam or the sons of men. And so what we see here is that the term sons of God must be talking about those individuals who were created by God, who were to uh, reflect the image that was given to them. And so whenever it comes to whether angels can, you know, have children or not with, you know, the, the children of this earth, we read in the 30th verse of Matthew, um, it says, for in the resurrection, this being us, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And so if the angels, if we're not going to marry and the angels mm -hmm. don't marry, they're not, uh, they're not having children. They're not having intercourse in the way that we have it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there is no... Uh, no children. There is no confusion with, say, angels coming down to earth and creating, creating the Nephilim. Yeah, exactly. And, and they would have created an army already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there would have been more than billions of people on this planet, more if angel could do that. They would have been uh, their, their own army. I don't know why the angels would uh, want to mingle with humans because they're made a little lower than the angels. That doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's why we, we need to take every Bible text in context. 
and and understand what the text is saying. Amen. So you see here, sons of God, Adam, which was the son of God, Seth also called the son of God. Because after sin, if you're choosing the second Adam, you're the son of God. But if you remain in your sinful nature, you're a son of man. Where Adam fell, you're staying there. So this is why Jesus is a must for every human being. You need the second Adam. So, um, so this is the text we're saying. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He's equal, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as men, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him. So he exalted him twice in heaven and after the cross and gave him a name which is above every name that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 6 to 11. So, a call? Yep. And then, you know, we talk about Michael since we're talking about the angels. We know that Michael is the archangel. Archangel, pretty much, it just means the chief of angels. And when you go do a search of uh, the name Michael in this context, you realize it's always when, you know, the two princes are contending against each other. You know, in Mm. Daniel chapter 10, Mm. it says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, who is that? We know this is talking about Satan. Mm -hmm. And then we're saying, we're saying Michael, one of the chief princes, you know, but in verse 21, it says, Michael, your prince. And then in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince. That, that, he, that Hebrew word, that word, the great, it's also translated in other passages as the greatest, you know, um, or the greater, whatever. But the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. I mean, it, it's pretty clear, you know, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels, the dragon and his angels. It's pretty clear when we see Michael, we know who we're talking about. And the reason we go to this is because some people struggle with that, that, you know, Jesus is considered as an angel. But as we've shown, Jesus lowered himself, made himself Mm -hmm. a little Lord, just like he did when he came on earth. You know, that happened also in heaven. And unfortunately, Satan failed that test. Lucifer failed that test. So that's the context behind it. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 is pretty clear that Jesus is the prince of peace. He's the prince. And then the other prince is the prince of the power of the air, Mm -hmm. or the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which is Satan. So whenever you think about Michael, think about this great controversy that is happening between, you know, Christ and Satan. And that's who Michael really represents, which means to be like God, you know. And just like we saw in Philippians chapter 2, he was equal with God. Mm-hmm. hope that makes sense. And if, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you, you, you can go, Nick. So if you look at the names, this is what's so amazing. And you, you mentioned uh, the meaning of Michael. Michael was, you know, Jesus' name before he came to earth. The only reason why he got the name of Jesus was because um, what Jesus means, and this is so amazing to me, is Jehovah is salvation. That's what it means. And so by him giving him that name, he's saying, I'm going to save the world. I came down as a human, and now the world's going to be saved. Amen. Amen. And another aspect of Michael, just like Carl mentioned, is a 
battle between the prince of darkness and the prince of light, Jesus, even for resurrection, for the body of Moses, to resurrect. When you see resurrection, Satan said, oh, no, this is mine. Oh, no, this is mine. I paid the price. You're not touching <laughs> this one. So we're going to have a contention in the last days when he's going to see, oh, man, Jesus is coming in the cloud and resurrecting everybody. What he, he did to Moses, he would love to say, no, I have the record of their sin. And Jesus, in their investigative judgment, is blooded out. So all these aspects is very important when you read First Thessalonians four sixteen, the voice of the archangel mm-hmm. and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's mine. The voice of the uh, that this is mine, and uh, Jude one nine. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he dispute about the body of Moses. So does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Mm-hmm. So that battle also for resurrection is real because Satan is keeping record of our sin. So we can so we, we don't take his spot in heaven. Amen. If, if I may add to that, and I just noticed it, um, that one verse shows the different attitudes between Satan and his angels and Jesus and his mm-hmm. angels. Jesus doesn't bring railing accusations. Mm-hmm. He rebukes like you would a child. Yeah. Oh, wow. Praise but God. Satan and his angels, they bring a railing accusation hoping you don't get better. Yeah. P- mm-hmm. Putting him in his place. Yep. Amen. Amen. And just oh. to see the, uh, the, the power of Michael, the monarch had resisted the impressions of the spirit of God. This is talking about Cyrus during the three weeks while Daniel was fasting and praying. But heaven's prince, the archangel, Michael, was sent to turn the heart of the stubborn king to take some decided action to answer the prayer of Daniel. So what the spirit of God didn't do or Michael was able to come in and kind of turn things around. So only who, who can do this? If not the spirit of God, if it's not the spirit of God, who can go, who, who's higher in this case, we know it's talking about Jesus for sure. Amen. Amen. So if people don't want to accept the impression of the Holy spirit, God has still to follow history. He has to step in. So history can be as the Bible. So he might, you cannot contend with Michael. Mm. Amen. So the test of John the Baptist. So uh, just like Nick was stated before, John the Baptist passed the test. And um, we could see that. Um, so Carl, can you read the yellow parts? Yep, Satan had stood ready to urge upon John the Baptist. Oh, sorry, every consideration that appeals to the ambition of the world's conquerors, Satan had stood ready to urge upon John the Baptist. But with the evidence before him of his power, he had steadfastly refused a splendid bribe. The attention which was fixed upon him, he had directed to another. Now he saw the tide of popularity turning away from himself to the Savior. Day by day, the crowds about him lessened. The disciples of John came to him with their grievances, saying, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. Those leaders in Israel were not willing to say with John, he must increase, but I must decrease. They arose with a new determination to put an end to their work that was drawing the people away from them, wishing to avoid all occasion for misunderstanding or dissension. He quietly seized his labors and withdrew to Galilee. We also, while loyal to truth, should try to avoid all that may lead to discord and misapprehension. For whenever these arise, they result in the loss of souls. 
Whenever circumstances occur that threaten to cause division, we should follow the example of Jesus and of John the Baptist. Amen. Amen. So we see here Satan was trying to push John to remain in high position. And he saw the crowd lessen every day going towards Jesus. So he can decrease so Christ can increase just like the seed. So God, that's why Jesus talked so well about John the Baptist. There was none, any prophet like him. He understood his role as a messianic harbinger pointing to Jesus. And every time we get deeper in the Bible, we keep pointing to Jesus. We keep pointing to him. So pride will never rise in our heart. It, it, it might come because temptation can come. But we say, nope. I have to remind myself that this is how Lucifer fell. I need to point to Jesus again and again and not, not to me. So this is a warning to ministers out there. You know, the enemy will tempt you. <laughs> yes. Will tempt you as you're doing God's work. And you just have to, just like, you know, John the Baptist, keep on decreasing. A lot of people think they need to exalt themselves in order for Jesus to be exalted. But we see it's you need to decrease in order for him to increase. And yep. So 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 e yeah. Nick. And also um what I saw on the last slide and this was something my um my brother told me this week. But it was, you know, um you could be right about whatever truth it is. But what's more important is not creating discord. Amen. I was, <clears throat> I was pretty floored whenever I heard that. And I was like, that is, that's so true because you're just creating an atmosphere for people to not accept it. And yeah, it's just amazing how this study, the study of the angels is really just lining up with a lot of things that I've been hearing lately. <laughs> Amen. 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 So, Call, call the last quote here. Yep. John had been called to lead out as a reformer. Because of this, his disciples were in danger of fixing their attention upon him, feeling that the success of the work depended upon his labors and losing sight of the fact that he was only an instrument to which God had wrought. I mean, you need to keep reminding yourself, you're just an instrument. But the yep. work of John was not sufficient to lay the foundation of the Christian church. When he had fulfilled his mission, another work was to be done, which his testimony could not accomplish. His disciples did not understand this. When they saw Christ coming in to take the work, they were jealous and dissatisfied. Do you see that? Hmm. So, so Christ, when he was taking the work from John, they wanted to keep following John and not Christ. They were jealous. So this is what the war in heaven, how it happened, how Lucifer was in an exalted position and Jesus slowly came up front and now like, oh no, we're not accepting this one. We, we want to keep going with you. So if you're loving a minister more than Christ, no. In, in, even in the church, God can at some point bring like a Paul. Even though you've been preaching for 20 years, 25 years, and Paul came um, above the disciple, he wrote more. You should not be jealous. And you, as long as that person have the spirit of Christ, hey, Christ choose you to do this work, praise God. If they're not against me, they're with me. And exactly. It, it just also quickly makes you think about, you know, people that feel impressed to start a ministry and, Next thing you know, they're just always hold on to that ministry, like year after year. And sometimes, you know, God might just have your work for a season. But it's exactly. always key for you to always check back with God, like, is this where you want me to keep going? You know, because it might just be in the seed that you were planting and then on to the next thing, <laughs> you know. Amen. Amen. So here, this fact the fallen angel would obscure that Christ was the only begotten son of God. And they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ. Mm -hmm. So you see, just like John the Baptist, the disciple that were jealous, they decided to follow 
uh, Lucifer. So, Nick? Yeah, it says, on, on the record of those who through self-abnegation uh, have entered into the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, stand, one in the Old Testament and one in the New, the names of Jonathan and of John the Baptist. So, Jonathan was supposed to take the throne after his father, but he saw that God chose David. He gave mm -hmm. him his sword. He made a covenant with David. He, he was a good messianic harbinger, Jonathan, and he gave it to the son of David. And when John the Baptist saw the other son of David, the real one, he did the same thing. From the Old and the New Testament, we see self-abnegation, and that's how heaven is going to be. It's going to be a fun place. Everybody is selfless. So no war. Only Jesus is elevated. So it's so important to understand that. So a lot of people might say, why, when this war was happening, why uh, Lucifer didn't die? Is because of Christ. He was the veil. He protected this controversy so nobody dies, just like Adam and Eve, until the 6,000 years is done and Christ revealed his love. So this is why he said, how come he didn't die? He was in the most holy place. We saw Uzza dying. But his body was, the veil was his flesh, Hebrews 10, 20. And what happened, Satan used false education on the side of the north to get to the angel. In his artful way, he drew the expression of doubt from them and when he was interviewed, he accused those who, whom he had educated. So he's putting the thought in your mind. He's asking you the same question over and over. He says, oh, you, you, you said that last week. So he was creating false education with his multitude of merchandise. He was trafficking the word now, trafficking on the side of the north. And this is why we need to go to the word and Avoid trafficking. When somebody asks us about the Bible, we give them Bible text, the explanation, and not we don't add on to the word. And if not, it will be a false education, just like in heaven. And what did Lucifer do? He associated by suggesting thoughts of criticism regarding the government of God. So criticism, there's a theory out there in falsification, it's called higher criticism and lower criticism. So what he's doing is trying to show people a new way to bring light to the word of God. So we see a canon. This is Agi from Ontario. I guess he's an Anglican clergy. It is very valuable, the branch of the biblical science. And if of the highest importance of auxiliary, the interpretation of the word of God, by the researchers, floods the light may be thrown on the scripture. No. So now they're doing also all type of philosophy and they bring it to the scripture. And now you have a bias and you don't understand. And that's what they call higher learning, higher criticism. It came from Lucifer. It's come from Satan. And that's why people see the Bible as a, another book, a myth. So, Nick? It sounds like the uh, historical critical method. Yep, you know, exactly. Of, uh, by, uh, how you would uh, interpret the Bible. And so, I mean, I know we, 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 we follow the... Um, proof text. The, the, the proof text, but also the... Um, it's the historical... I can't remember. Historical uh, critical, that's the bad one, and the proof yeah. text method. Yeah, uh, there's a, there's another one. I can't remember yes. what it's and what it's called right now, but it's it's a historicist method and the proof text combined. It's just one big word. I can't remember what it's called, but yep. So 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 as long we do line upon line, precept upon precept, mm -hmm. that's a thing that we should apply in our lives. 
because this is how you find truth. And the Holy Spirit is going to signify it like, okay, you find that text, you explain that text, do you follow the context? If not, what's going to happen? You're going to fall backward and be broken in the snare. This is where Satan brings his doubts. If you don't follow this precept, you, you'll fall. So the proof text method is self-explanatory method from the Bible. So, you know, all scripture is given by inspiration. So the Bible can explain itself. So it's very dangerous to say, oh, no, the Bible cannot explain itself. Let me find other ways. So even in our sanctification, God each year is showing us things, it's precept upon precept, line upon line. And we're being sealed into Christ more and more. So it's very important. And uh, Carl? Order is heaven's first law, and every school should, in this respect, be a model of heaven. System and order are manifest in all the works of God throughout the universe. Order is the law of heaven, and it should be the law of God's people on the earth. And you see that throughout the Bible, you know, the studies that we just shown how God always using the angels to get to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, God always respects his order, the order that he has set. And this is what he expects for us as well, who are in on earth right now. That kingdom come that will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, verse 10. Thank you. So this is where the war started after that. We know what happened. Satan uh, got his angel and Jesus got his angel. And they were kicked out of heaven and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against his angel and prevailed not. And was their place not found? Uh, I cannot see what is after that. Can you see guys? Uh, any more in heaven any more in heaven so thank you so we see here that they, their place was no longer and you know, say so what was their weapon what was their fighting you can maybe find a psalm 55 21 the word of his mouth was smoother than butter but war was in his heart his word was softer than oil yet they were drawn sword so it was a battle of word the true education against the false education. So what, what kind of oil is it? is it? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it a false spirit from Satan? So it was a battle of word. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Nope. I don't want to believe in him. I don't want to accept him. So the war we're having in this planet, Earth right now, is the same thing. It can get physical, but it's the same concept of word. I, uh, now, yep. Oh, I uh, I heard a pastor say once. I think it was on the word for war mm -hmm. in the Greek text. It's more like um, it's either war or fought. Um, it's more in the lines of what we would consider political debate. Mm -hmm. Debates, exactly. Yep. Yeah, so, and that's why they get the Star Wars, all these things. But the real concept is the battle, the battle for the Word of God, pretty much. It, it, exactly. That's why we got to follow the proof text method. And also, I heard another pastor say, because he was talking about all the schooling that he had, the studying of the Greek and Hebrew, and he's like, you know, all that stuff is great. But the Bible says we're going to be taught by the Spirit, and that's what matters most. All the other stuff is bonuses. Mm -hmm. Amen. I agree. So I really like that. So, so we have here, because they were cast out, are the demons already in hell? And they are not. Because in Mark 5, 1 to 7, 12, and 12 to 13, and he cried, we're talking about this man, were possessed by legions, meaning a thousand of demons, he cried with a loud voice and said, what I have to do with thee, Jesus, the, thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. So there's a time to torment them after, this, after the, 
millennium, the 6,000 years, they're going to spend 1,000 years in jail and solitary confinement. And after that, now is the time of their torment. But people believe, oh, I'm, some people are with the angel already, I'm being tormented. And it's not true because after that, he's going to send the legions into the swine. And after they want to go, they're going to go in the sea. So all that, we have Bible text to see that falling angels are not in hell. They're tempting us right now. They're playing UFO. They're doing spiritualism. That's their work. So if you believe they're already in, 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 in hell, it's not true. That time has not come yet. And once they get to hell, there's no coming out until they turn into ashes. Exactly. Because only God knows how to destroy them. So the Roman military in the New Testament and angels, we could see um, Rome and their empire had profound effect on the New Testament. That effect was far from more most people realized. Much of the very nature of the society in which the events take place is because of the presence of the governance of Rome. The disciple, the apostle Paul, were profoundly affected by Rome and the Roman military units. So we could see uh, a centurion and his servant in Matthew 8, 9 is 100 people. So, you know, just come to my house. You know, you have so I have soldiers under me saying to Jesus, just say a word and your angel just going to obey you just like they're obeying me, the centurion. You have Acts 12, 4 and 5. The quartarian of 16 soldiers kept Peter. Quartarian is, is a set of four. So four by four is 16. After that, you have the cohort. We're arresting Jesus, the bed of man. It's 480. So you can imagine 480 men come to arrest Jesus. That was a peaceful man. That was healing disease, casting out demons. Oh, man. They came at him like he was a criminal. And uh, the guy possessed with legion, Mark 5, 9, a thousand demons. So, so ranking in numbers also when we're thousand and ta- ten thousand, a myriad is ten thousand angels. So you'll see that in the investi- investigative judgment in Daniel seven, thousand and thousand coming. So myriad, I never knew it was ten thousand. So we're not going to read all the text, but I, I'm I'm sure you're getting. Um, the picture here. And also, we cannot really count all the angels because we don't know how much there are. Only Jesus knows the number. But here come Mount Sinai and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable company of angels. You can't even count. We God is trying to give parameters of numbers, how much, but there's a lot of angels. And the angels also protect. So even when you go in a war, so Nick, can you read uh, this passage? Yes, this is found in Patriarchs and Prophets. Uh, The angels of heaven shielded Jonathan and his attendant. Angels fought by their side, and the Philistines fell before them. The earth trembled as though a great multitude with horsemen and chariots were approaching. Jonathan recognized the tokens of divine aid, and even the Philistines knew that God was working for the deliverance of Israel. I'm going to read the rest. Great (laughs) fear seized upon the host, both in the field and in the garrison. In confusion, mistaking their own soldiers for enemies, the Philistines began to slay one another. Wow. So, 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 Jonathan was in war, and there was someone. He didn't even have that many men, but because he was true to God, God gave him a host of angels, and they hear, they heard horsemen and shepherds like, "Oh man, he has a great army with him." So, do you see how many angels do we have on our sides to fight to preach the word? We're like presidents, <laughs> yeah, and queens and kings. If we take hold of the word of God, nobody can really touch us unless your time comes. That means 
you have a host of angels working with you, preaching the word. So you should <clears throat> preach the word with confidence. And what's even better is even if bad stuff was to happen, mm -hmm. you got still that many angels to get you out of that mess. Amen. 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 And we have another example. When David was winning, he, uh, you know, he killed Goliath. And the woman answered one to another as they played and said, Saul had slain his thousands and David his 10,000. For Samuel 18, 7. But in Psalm 91, verse 7, it says, A thousand shall fall on thy side and 10,000 on thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. So the protection we can have we have angels that can block 10,000 demons that are trying to attack us that we don't even see. And a thousand on our left side. So with David, what was the, the connection is that David was following the will of God. As you follow the will of God, you taking more men down. So because Saul was disobedient, he only was only killing a thousand. Imagine if Saul submitted his heart Fully to Jesus, how many he would have killed in a war. But now the pride came up when that those women sing that song. So imagine Peter that ran from Jesus. And when he received the Holy Spirit, 3,000 angels are fighting in the, the book of Acts to save Saul with us when we're going to receive the Holy Spirit. 5,000, 3,000, we're going to be winning the same way that David is getting thousands. So okay. do you see the picture of us cleaving to Jesus and receiving those angels that's helping us in battle? It's, it, 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 it's beautiful here. It's Amen. beautiful. Paul? Ministering spirits. So as we saw, they protect, they help Angels are sent on missions of mercy to the children of God, to Abraham with promises of blessing, to the gates of Sodom to rescue righteous Lot from his fiery doom, to Elijah as he was about to perish from weariness and hunger in the desert, to Elisha with chariots and horses of fire surrounding the little town where he was shut in by his foes, to Daniel while seeking divine wisdom in the court of a heathen king, or abandoned to become the lion's prey, to Peter, doomed to death in Herod's dungeon, to the prisoners at Philippi, to Paul and his companions in the night of tempest on the sea, to open the mind of Cornelius to receive the gospel, to dispatch Peter with the message of salvation to the Gentile stranger. Thus, holy angels have in all ages ministered to God's people. So, you know, I never pictured this, but through this presentation, you see angels don't sleep either. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I mean, They're always working. <laughs> it says God don't sleep, but the angels, heaven is not sleeping. Amen. Amen. Always watching over us. And uh, on top of them ministering to us, guess what? We have personal angels. A guardian angel is appointed to every follower of Christ. Amen. Wow. These heavenly watchers shield the righteous from the power of the wicked one. And then I'll go down. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven, their angels will always behold the face of my father. Matthew 18 verse 10. The angels appointed to minister to the children of God have at all times access to his presence. That is wow. powerful. Makes it seem like God cares a lot about the early stages of life, you Amen. know, because I don't know exactly how the system goes, but think about the angels having just direct access. Boom. Yep. They don't have, they don't have to go through the ranks. It's all of a sudden, oh, it's a child. Nope. You come directly to me. Amen. 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 And then in the last days, all the way towards the end, Look what's going to happen. I was shown those those who had whom I had before seen weeping and praying in agony of spirit 
the company of guardian angels around them had been doubled. Mm. And they were clothed with an armor from their head to their feet. And how come they're able to be doubled? Because those that, and that couldn't keep going, you know, mm-hmm. there are those that are going to keep agonizing, keep praying, keep being faithful. And those are going to receive the guardian angels of those that stopped, you know, the foolish virgins. And it's going okay. to be double. So keep pushing, keep enduring, and we're going to have more protection as we move forward. Amen. 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 So quickly, so Christ has the human nature was created. So even though Jesus was one of represent men and one represent God, the Father and the Holy Spirit created a body prepared with the divine and but he could not use the divine so all to say he did not even possess the angelic power but um can somebody read the text after that it was oh it was human identical with our own so we have a study on the incarnation maybe you can dive into that so why are we talking about this is because satan really didn't know the power of Michael. And he really thought he could take Michael in heaven. But when he realized Michael kicked him out, Jesus, he says, I have another chance. So Nick, can you read the statement? Yes. He, Satan, had proudly boasted to the heavenly angels that when Christ should appear, taking man's nature, he would be weaker than himself and he would overcome him by his power. He exalted that Adam and Eve in Eden could not resist his insinuations when he appealed to their appetite. You know, at reading that, do you think that Satan didn't think about the Holy Spirit and that at all? You know, like the Holy Spirit was going to come down on Christ. You don't think that he thought? <laughs> with full measure, without measure. <laughs> with full measure. <laughs> I, I think sin really blinds you. <laughs> you yep. know. He, he didn't see the full picture. He was so focused on him who was going to be able to win this whole thing and not thinking of the Holy Spirit and Jesus pretty much how he's uh, willing to sacrifice all for yeah, our, yeah. And, for and, our and, and the fact that And the fact that Jesus was more powerful, he was Michael, so he <clears> says, oh, I'm going to take this one very easily. But he was, Jesus was surrounded with angels he had full measure of the Holy Spirit, and he was listening to his father daily, every moment by moment. So this is why Christ says, you can overcome the same way I overcame and do greater works if you are attentive to Jesus and to the Holy mm. Spirit that's talking to you. You can do greater works. But because he got Adam, he really thought is a pattern for him to yeah. be jesus at this time what is it um there's this quote uh the, the what is it um the righteousness of god or the work of god is laying the glory of man in the dust yes, yes. and that's what jesus did he literally took that human nature and put it into the dust <laughs> amen Paul. Mm-hmm. He who could appear clothed with the brightness of the heavenly seraphs before Christ in the wilderness of temptation comes to men in the most attractive manner as an angel of light. He appeals to the reason by the presentation of elevating themes. He delights the fancy with enrapturing scenes, and he enlists the affection by his eloquent portrayals of love and charity. And it's interesting because we saw that same deception with uh, the Catholic Church, the papacy, of how they decked themselves in Revelation mm-hmm. chapter 17 with the harlot. And that's mm-hmm. all that they have to attract us because really there's nothing within. Within, they're empty. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. he used the seraph mode, the light to attract. So is he going to do that? So we're going to establish a principle. We are coming to an end. A land of darkness and darkness itself and the shadow of death without any order and where the light is darkness. 
So if you don't have order in your life, there's darkness. So even in scripture, the history of the church, the history of the Bible, if you mixing up stories, mixing up stuff, just like the rapture, they take it out of the 70 weeks, they, they make a prophecy out of it, they make this, you're going to receive darkness. So even in the last days when Satan is about to appear, we need to follow the order of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So we know about Satan uh, deceptive act, the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will part person at Christ. And they call it the, the strong, almost overmastering delusion because he's trying to seduce the world at the end of time. But where do you place that? Do you place it before the Sunday law? I know we talked about that in Revelation 17, but do we place it before the Sunday law or after? So let's see a couple of texts that will explain that. So we have, by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy, a violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. So you have to be disconnected first. Our country shall repudiate every principle of the, its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of the purple falsehood and delusion. So now, after the Sunday law, you're opening the provision of the falsehood and the delusion found in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 12. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall not believe a lie, that they shall all might be them who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So God has to preach the word first for us to receive the word. And after, if you don't really want to receive the word, strong delusion can come upon you and Satan can do his marvelous work of deception. So, Nick, can you read this statement? Yes. It says, Satan sees that he is about to lose his case. He cannot sweep in the whole world. He makes one last desperate effort to overcome the faithful by deception. He does this in personating Christ. He clothes himself with the garments of royalty, which have been accurately described in the vision of John. He has power to do this. He will appear to his deluded followers, the Christian world who received not the love of the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, the transgression of the law, as Christ coming the second time. So it's pretty clear they're going to have a chance to listen to the three angels' message mm. and the loud cry before that strong delusion come. But if you place the strong delusion before the loud cry, there's no chance for people to receive the truth because they're going to see they thought they're going to see a seraph full of light coming down. They're going to say, oh, it's Jesus. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. But we see here, God's going to give the chance first. And it's his last effort to do that. Mm -hmm. So if it's his last effort, it's pretty clear from this statement that it's after. So, uh, Carl? One effort more, and then Satan's last device is employed. He hears the unceasing cry for Christ to come, for Christ to deliver them. This last stra strategy is to personate Christ and make them think their prayers are answered. Hmm. Satan is striving to gain every advantage. Disguised as an angel of light, he will walk the earth as a wonder worker. Hmm. You know, but one point there will but on one point there will be a marked distinction. Satan will turn the people from the law of God, notwithstanding this, so well will he counterfeit righteousness that if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. Crowned heads, presidents, rulers, and high places will bow to his false theories. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall shew great signs and wonders, and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Matthew 24, so, verses 24 and 25. 
Thank you, Carl. So we see here clearly it's Matthew 24, 24, and 25. Yeah, there's false Christ. There's false prophet already. There's sign and wonders happenings with, through spiritualism. But the last deception is to sweep those um, even that kept the commandment to see you see. I'm here. He's trying his last effort. It's not before the Sunday law. God will not permit that. God is a God of love. He's, he cannot let a strong delusion get everybody and after the three angels message of preaching and the fourth angel coming down. No, we have to place things in their order. So the study of today, I don't know if any of you had a last comment before we read we, we the last one? Uh, it, you know, it, it just, uh, what I've noticed at the end of this mm -hmm. is um, just how, seri how serious it is, um, mm -hmm. how easily we could get fooled. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it's upon each, each one of us to really know Jesus, to really know Amen. who he is, because, um, you know, nobody wants to be deceived. Nobody wants to be lied to. Mm -hmm. but sometimes it's easier to follow that way. You know, that's why the mark of the beast isn't just on the forehead. It's also on the hand. Mm -hmm. It works. And so, so it, you know, studying the angels and the difference in character, it'll it's definitely going to help us get prepared for the time we're living in because there isn't much time left. Mm. There isn't. And we need to be ready. Amen. Amen. Mm. So the last statement here, we have received the law by the disposition of angels. So we see here, they're really ministers and have not kept it. So in the desert, Israel not only received the Ten Commandments from the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit was writing it, but this position of angels brought them as Moses is teaching. Those angels are touching the people. So they're workers. They were helping. But what happened? I've not kept it. So that's why they fell in the desert. But here, when divine power is combined with human effort, the work will spread like fire in the stubble. God will employ agency whose origin men will not be able to discern. Angel will not do a work which men might have had the blessing of accomplishing had they not neglect the claim of God. So we're going to have the help, guys, of the angel this one as men to help us finishing this work. When you feel you're alone, um, this Bible study might, might not go on. God will make that person meet someone in the street is, and talk to them about the Bible, what you just talked, study about with them to reaffirm and say, you know what? I want to continue this Bible study. I want to go through it. So you don't know how the angels going to about to work with us. So we have in our rank, the angels with the Holy spirit working to finish this work. Amen. So I hope you've been blessed. Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy river side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Thank you, Eerly, for that uh, wonderful presentation of the angels. And I know I was uh, blessed by it, for sure. There was a lot of stuff that I learned today that I <clears throat> it just lined up perfectly with everything that I had heard this week. And praise God for that. I hope that it's been a blessing for everybody watching these videos. I, um, I would ask everybody to subscribe and, you know, click the notification button. We don't want you to miss these presentations because we really believe that God is speaking 
uh, now through many people, not just this channel, but many channels, because he's trying to get us ready for his soon return. And we ask you that you uh, watch uh, last week's presentation on Revelation 17, but that we also ask that you come back uh, in two weeks to, uh, to hear part two of this, because you don't want to miss that. We're going to go even more in depth into the angels, and you will see just how involved they are in your life. And so let us close with prayer. Father, thank you for this study. Thank you for giving us glimpses into what all you are doing for us. Lord, the angels are working hard. You are working hard for our salvation. Please let us heed your voice. Please let us heed what you are trying to lead us to, Lord. Let us not be stubborn, but let us be humble, Lord. I ask that as we... Um, as we go about the rest of our lives, we may know that our guardian angels are with us and that at the end of times, we'll receive a double portion to protect us, Lord. Thank you for the, your great love, Lord. We love you. Amen.